Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe with our entire investment committee. Uh, actually, we're down one man today, Brian Seitel is out. We're recording without him here on Monday morning. Market is open. I'm David Bonson, your Chief Investment Officer. I'm surrounded by my colleagues on the Investment Committee at the Bonson Group. To my right, Julian Fazor, Director of Equity Research. Across the table, Robert Graham. And across from me, Dea Pernas. So we have the four of us here, and we're doing a special edition to talk about the market. Uh, last week, we were heavily focused on coronavirus. I suppose some of the things we're going to talk about today are going to necessarily have to involve that as well. But uh, definitely the most volatile week in the market we'd had since going back to about last August. Uh, a couple of little periods in October um, getting there, but but certainly not uh, four, five, six days of downside volatility uh, since that August downturn. And so it's enough to kind of startle some investors. And now here we are. We opened up... Um, about 200 points in the market here Monday morning, and at one point it had gotten up uh, closer to 300. As we're sitting here talking now, it's come down. We're only up 170, so that's kind of bouncing around a bit. It's pretty sector-specific this morning. Some were uh, expecting maybe U.S. markets to open Monday even uh, worse off just based on the fact that the Shanghai markets had opened up last mm. night and were down um, at one point about 9%, closed down a little over 7 and and the reality um, was that that the market there had been closed through a lot of this last week, so it was kind of this built up you know deal going in. Okay, so that's the lay of the land. Market last week was down 600 on Friday. It was down 400 Monday. It was up a few hundred a couple of days in between. So I think from peak to trough we're down a thousand ish in the Dow, and now um, we come into this new week and of course the new month month of january ended up being down on the month after at one point being up about uh three percent so you you could talk coronavirus we're going to talk yield curve um we're we're going to talk geopolitics uh american politics there's a lot of things on the table and we're going to talk earnings season um but i guess the broader question i'll throw out that i'll start with you day i will go around mm. Um, does this particular market hiccup do anything to you? Does it make you nervous? Does it make you want to be a big buyer? Are you in a wait and see mode? What what questions you have? Just I'm throwing it out there in a general yeah. sense. Well, it makes me uh, kind of brace, uh, you know, our mindset really for more volatility going forward. I think that we haven't seen this level of volatility for quite some time, uh, and. I think just preparing, you know, for that kind of short-term volatility, I think is important. As far as outlook goes, I, I think uh, a lot of the the fundamental, uh, the ways that the fundamentals have been affected from all this fear about the coronavirus and you, you know all all the uh, coverage the media has on it, is short-term in nature. I think that the, yeah, there are some uh, there are some fundamentals that have been affected, but it's important to realize that uh, when you look historically. Uh, at a lot of these diseases and the coverage and the impact it has been short-term in nature. So, so uh, you know, I, I don't mind the, the enhanced volatility. Uh, I think we're prepared for it, and it's, uh, it's important to, to, to get comfortable with a little bit of volatility. So, Robert, it's a volatility story, or is there some other stuff beneath the surface bothering you? I mean, obviously, you know, what people are calling a pandemic and all this kind of stuff would, would bother anyone to some extent. But, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit comforted in some some regard because a lot of the activity, I think, particularly last week in the markets was was earnings driven. You know, we saw certainly a lot of strength in certain sectors and, and some weakness in others. And I think that uh, is, is encouraging to me because, again, we, we always talk about how the fundamentals matter. And at the end of last month, the fundamentals do and did matter. So the uh, fundamentals were what was pushing markets lower or fundamentals were holding markets in together? I, uh, what, in what sense were fundamentals the material aspect last week? Just different, different sectors were having you know, earnings revisions. Some, some specific companies in, in tech did really well in terms of mm -hmm. their earnings reports. And then we saw you know, some weakness certainly in energy, most notably. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the coronavirus, you can see from the market activity last week and, and today, particularly when the, the Asian markets opened, that hit those markets particularly hard. So there's no doubt that that's stirring some volatility there. But let's remember, anytime there was any news of, of something negative in China, we see those, those indices get hit hard. And we've talked a lot about how those markets are not necessarily perfectly tied to the, the economic forces in China in particular. So there's no surprise that those, those markets are, are more volatile and, and open down today. 
yesterday. Yeah, I, I agree. Julian, what do you think in the current environment? Is this uh, right now, are we living through kind of this volatility uh, experience? Or do you think that there are legitimate questions about fundamentals, uh, whether positive or negative, so, as well as uh, earnings quality? Well, I would say, if I think, I think it's healthy and we should be grateful that there's still a little bit of volatility and a little bit of price discovery in this market with, you know, the Fed and central banks intervening so much, killing volatility. So that's a good sign that you're seeing, you know, when there's some bad news, markets go down and that creates opportunity as well to, you know, buy and, and chip in the stocks you like. So um, I guess I think the fundamental, fundamental picture is still good. Uh, earnings season, you know, uh, we are halfway through earnings now. Uh, we had uh, busiest weeks for the, our names last week. Uh, and it was uh, very mixed, uh, I, I guess. So if you look at... Uh, you know, as well, on the, uh, we can't talk about the specific list names, but if you look at the S&P 500, as of Friday, about 50% of the 500 mm -hmm. uh, companies that reported, and they always, you know, beat earnings. So it's more, the question is not how many beat earnings, it's more like if you compare to a historical, uh, you know, number on average, about 70% uh, beat on EPS and beat, and beat on revenue. And this quarter it was slightly off that number and when they beat they didn't beat as much as they usually do so it was pretty mixed and as you say uh, robert you know it was very um, depending on sector so like uh, you know uh, consumer and discretionary and tech did very well and then energy industrials didn't do so well so it's uh, it's been you know interesting uh, so far earning season and i guess uh, because of you know the coronavirus happening at the same time, it's uh, you know people are not so focused on earnings and a bit probably too much on uh, what's happening in China. Mm. But um, you know, I'd say fundamentally, uh, I mean, if you're a Chinese investor, for sure you have to worry, and it's, it's going to impact the economy uh, for one quarter maybe or two. But as a you know a global investor, um, it's still early days to know exactly what the impact is going to be. I guess if we look at uh, we have some data from uh, the SARS um, uh, back like 15 years ago I think it's hard to say exactly what the impact was uh, globally but China the consensus view I think now is that what there was the impact was about one percent of GDP in China mm -hmm. so is it it looks like it's gonna get worse this one it looks like it's worse just with the measure they're taking you know quarantine 50 million people a lot of businesses have closed, you know, you hear about American companies, you know, closing, you know, shutting down operations in some provinces or even all of China. So I guess that's going to be a real impact on the Chinese economy. Uh, but, uh, you know, to, how long, to what extent? for how long? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. the question. Yeah, there's a lot. That's the, what the market is struggling with, the uncertainty behind it. If, if we knew that it was going to last two weeks or, you know, three months, I think... Just the amount, the volatility be very different, or how the market reacts is very different. But uncertainty is really what drives volatility, and, and the uncertainty around the impact. But is the, the uncertainty data around the health aspect, or is it around the market response to the health impact? I, I believe the uncertainty is around the health uh, health aspect of it. I I don't think that. Uh, uh, generally speaking, that people know exactly uh, how dangerous this virus is, how how dangerous it could be, exactly how it's spreading. I think there's a lot of questions around the health aspect, or maybe there's 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 people that uh, there's certain experts that understand it well, but I generally don't feel that uh, the consensus uh, feels that there's any sort of uh, solid understanding around how how this virus is spreading. So. And you think that's what the market's responding to is the uncertainty around the medical um, aspect of how it's spreading well, as opposed to the uncertainty around um, what the impact of supply chain would be or, or what um, China's, China's response is, has been. I, well, I think the market's just reacting to fear. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, just, I, I think all those things matter. Exa you know, how, how this virus is spreading, how it's going to impact supply chains, how is it going to impact China, China's import appetite. You know, are our companies going to continue to close stores? Those are all questions. Those are all, all, all wrapped in the same thing, in my opinion. All, all those are related. Yeah, I don't think we can take I, – I totally agree with you on, on all yeah. points, but I don't think we can really put put down the supply chain constraints. And I think there's a lot of uncertainty around that too because let's, let's remember that the Lunar New Year, their big holiday, that already would be a period where there would be, you know, a dampening of activity, right? So we haven't, and they've prolonged that holiday at a national level, I guess. Mm -hmm. We haven't really seen the, the supply chain disruptions come into effect. And I think there's probably a good deal of uncertainty around that. How much is this coronavirus going to start hurting supply chains? 
And to what extent is that lost supply going to impact uh, demand uh, going forward? Yeah, I think I think that there is um, <clears throat> a number of different layers here, and I would start with what I do intend to be a kind of ridiculous uh, example, and then bring it in from there. Although, suppose I suppose there's some people who may not even take it to be that ridiculous. But like, is there anyone who would say, are there market actors when we talk about uncertainty that have fear that one year from now, one year? that we will still have this kind of complete, open-ended, unresolved problem of coronavirus, medically or economically. Like I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that most market actors believe that in a year this will not be a story. So the question is, are we talking about one week of uncertainty, three months, six months? What's the most negative person think this thing could linger and have impact? Let's say that six months. I don't think it is, but let's say it is. What's the quickest that this thing exits the newspaper? One week? I don't think that's the case well, either. I, th- I think this the, the story will change a little bit, too. We were talking, actually, before the podcast. I mean, what if this thing gets into Africa, right? That's going to be a, a big deal. There's going to be probably a more massive loss of life. But, you know, I'm not trying to downplay that, but the effects on supply chains and... and How global- does it get into Africa if nobody can leave the country? Well, that's the, the the incubation period is longer than the Chinese suspected. Yeah. So there's already people that got out of Wuhan, I guess, before they they got quarantined. So that I mean, not to play doctor, but I think that's probably a, a big deal. But see, that's yeah. the thing I think markets are least concerned about is that there's a medical component that's a little more frightening than we thought. Uh, I think that there's some all of the fear mongering stuff around yeah. that, and and for those of us who saw arachnophobia as yeah. as a kid. <laughs> The, the, I, I think that that's probably, if you make a list of market ramifications, yeah. that's the lowest on the list. Yeah. So, so you think you think the market, it, what it cares about is really how it feeds into the, fu- the short-term well, fundamental? I agree with you completely. All yeah. the markets responding to right now is just fear of unknown. Okay, okay. And, and I believe uh, that the markets did not need an excuse to want to sell off. I think this became that excuse. But um, mm-hmm. there is a uh, frustration... From, for those that just have a very, very short-term w- period here, if you only want to look at 2017, 2018, 2019, that's not a very long period of time, but three years, I have lost count. You know, like I do this for a living. I mm-hmm. do it passionately. I do it with a, high, with a, uh, a OCD uh, memory. And I can't even tell you how many times in three years there has been this significant step up, questions asked, concerns posed, and a week later, you can't even find someone still talking about it because the headline has changed. And, th- and those things are, are permanent in that there's always a need for the story to be changing to something else. People get bored. They quit clicking. They quit watching. I'm not blaming it all on the media. I think that there's a legitimate uncertainty about it. But I guess what I'm saying is that there's two layers. The immediate volatility we've experienced is not related to someone discounted the impact of cash flows uh, by XYZ company not getting access to ABC you sure. know, supply chain and therefore is fundamentally priced in this problem. It's an uncertainty about it. No problem. That happens all the time. And, and so then the question is, if you accept my premise that we're not going to be facing like a two-decade Spanish flu or something, we do. Then, then the question is, are we really supposed to believe that investors as opposed to traders are are wanting to reallocate around um, a three month story and I think that's on the pessimistic side I think it could be it could be a four week story and 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 then you get into these other things going on that no one's talking about and mm-hmm. I saw this happen so much last year you'd hear like oh China uh, the the dollar one uh, uh, exchange is broken seven and everyone's talking about Trump's tweet and I'm like it's currency this is a currency story and and the same week that this happened, this happened back in August of 2011, where um, the S&P downgraded U.S. debt from AAA to AA+. Plus. First of all, I don't know a person in the world who ever even knew the S&P rated U.S. debt. Like, what are the, like, well, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. But, oh, also, Greece is about to fall into the Mediterranean Sea, and the biggest default in sovereign nation history but no, it was the S&P downgrade. That's what was causing the August 11 volatility. In hindsight, any credible economist knows the volatility we had in summer 2011 was Eurocentric. It was not an S&P downgrade story. I don't think it helped. It added yeah, to some yeah. noise. But we get this wrong all the time. Now, coronavirus may be the primary. I'm not trying to d- take that away. But you have a yield curve. You had a 10-year, one, it was at 190s, come back to 150. Okay? That's, yeah. a, that, that, that's a problem. There's something going on there. Now, this morning, I see the manufacturing figure back up higher. 
uh, earnings seem at 45% through, we seem to be 50-50 on earnings, really good, really bad. We don't see this overwhelmingly out, out performance driven cycle so far. So I'm wondering, back to the question I posed last week, is coronavirus involved because its uncertainty allows one to get over the hump, but the hump is the continued skittishness of this most disbelieved bull market yeah, in history. Right. So, you, so you're saying that it's less really the coronavirus and more that the market just needs something, some sort of excuse. That, inve- that certain and investors need Certain investors excuse. need something. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think it, this speaks to how difficult it can be sometimes to draw like a direct causal link between general market volatility and headlines. I think it's, uh, I, when t- if, you, if you're just always come, trying to come up with a reason for a market sell-off, I think it's uh, it's your it rank oversimplification in many ways, and you know, there's a lot there's a lot of uh, invest and there's a lot of decisions that are totally contrary to each other that all average out to maybe the market declining, but yeah. it's hard to point to I one. I was going to say it's been a, such a straight line and you know so much momentum since the phase one deal was you know or the reversal I guess of yeah. the Chinese uh, U.S. Uh, you know fight in you know, let's say September October. That you know, we know like when the, you have so little volatility for so long on the straight line, you know, market everything going in the same direction, that the, the market is going to look for an excuse to mm-hmm. you know for a, a little sell off, and uh, I think it's healthy that you have these uh, these corrections. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's I, never yeah, going to be a straight line. I agree. Um, yeah. But I guess what's interesting if you look at uh, SARS and again as a precedent, thinking about when could we see how long is going to be the headlines. I think I, I would agree with you that it's probably a question of weeks. Because uh, what happens again with SARS is um, basically when the Chinese government realized that the, the severity of the outbreak and, and uh, at the time it, the peak uh, infection was just four weeks later. So if you look at like they already quarantined all these people. So assuming that it's effective, you could be at peak uh, infection with this new virus within sometime in February. Mm. And I guess if again looking at SARS as a precedent, that's pretty much from the moment the peak was reached and numbers were starting to go down, that people you know st- f- f- stopped talking about it and just discounted the you know the virus has gone and just uh, went back into uh, Asian uh, mm-hmm. you know emerging markets. So maybe you know in March we probably talk about the elections again and not about this anymore. Or maybe tomorrow we're talking about the elections <laughs> again. I mean that's the thing is that in in. Uh, and again, we're recording here right now um, before the Iowa caucus results, and so it, it's possible some stuff could kind of change, but it certainly looks as if Bernie Sanders is going to end up winning tonight, if you believe some of the polls. And I, I, I find it hard to believe that there's no coronavirus, but we were sitting here with Bernie at a potentially significant lead in Iowa and New Hampshire, and the yield curve flattening, if not inverting, that we wouldn't have another reason to be talking and doing a special yeah. podcast. You know, especially with earnings season being highly volatile. About, about a sell-off? If that, it, it would not oh. be a sell-off. It would just be volatility. Even mm-hmm. even this uh, sell-off has been preceded by triple-digit upside volatility as well. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're back to, it, it seems, in this last week and a half. is the same thing we had had significantly in August and throughout all of 2018. When you had sell-offs, they lasted two days generally, three days on the bad ones. And then you got real big, uh, you re- real big upside, and and rem- and, and it reminds me, you know, th- it reinforces, I should say, the idea of like what does one believe they're going to do, like what honestly, is the trade around it? If you say I want to just get out and I'll come back in when it's better, you're admitting I'm just going to give up a thousand points. I'll come back in with a thousand points higher. Okay, I, no one's going to say that. So they have to believe they're going to get out Monday, get back in Wednesday. Get out again Thursday, back in the following Tuesday, out Wednesday, in Thursday, out for three days, in for four days. There, come on. But that's what you're dealing with right now. And literally, does anyone doubt that you could come in on Thursday this week and have the futures up 500 points and come in next Tuesday and have the futures down 500 points? The, 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 it's a, this was, a 20 years I managed money, never saw any of this stuff. It's total insanity because there are, people are so afraid of 2 to 3%. 2 to 3%. Wow. You can be. I would say it's equally stupid if I had to seven percent, ten plus. That's a big deal. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of capital allocation. Mm-hmm. Two to three, five to seven doesn't even trigger rebalancing. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, so I don't know what anyone is really supposed to do at, at, when they're afraid of two to three percent, um, other than accept that they're probably not invested right. Right. Because mm-hmm. you cannot be in equities if you can't take two to three percent, and you can't be in equities if you can't take five to seven. And, and longer term, you can't take equities if you can't handle 10 to 20. 
-hmm. That's a fact. I, I'm saying it to every client of ours right now. If you cannot handle that type of volatility, you can't have any part of your money in equities. It's going to happen. Yeah, it's, all, it's almost like this compression we've seen in volatility has totally changed investors ex or traders, investors' expectation around what volatility really is or actually is like. And 2 or 3% is, like you said, uh, especially in the long-term scheme of things, totally insignificant. By the way, it's 3% of downside that followed two weeks of 3% upside. Yeah, so like on right. January 1, my financial goals were, were totally... Uh, what I'm supposed to believe is that on January 20th, everything was set, right. and now January 30th, it's not. But that January 1, was it okay or not? Because you hadn't made that 3% that you just lost yet. So what, so what, what exactly took place fundamentally in your life? Now, by the way, I should say this, because there's a lot of non-clients and clients that listen. I'm not saying this in response to our clients at the Monson Group. I, don't, I can't speak for every advisor, but I, I'm not sitting here getting overwhelmed with clients freaking out about 2 or 3%. I think we've done a really good job in our firm educating our clients on what we believe and don't believe. And most importantly, telling them the truth. Mm -hmm. Like, it, yes, you're right. We cannot trade in Tuesday and out Wednesday successfully. But the second truth that goes along with that truth is that no one else can either. And I think that's the part we have to continue hitting home. But it's very clear that there is this kind of general wave and fear. You look at mutual fund and ETF inflows, outflows. There are people that are apparently believing they need to be in Monday and out Wednesday and all these things. And uh, I'm telling you, it is not going to end well for people. If they do not accept the truisms of asset allocation and time in the market. Mm -hmm. And you can say, well, that's nonsense. You know, you can say all that, but I don't want to be there for coronavirus. You go, okay, well, so you wait till coronavirus goes down and i'm telling you that when coronavirus is gone there will be a new virus and it may not be a health epidemic there will always be something to fear always there's always there's all, there'll always be some or fears to manufacture whether they're real or not to keep people from being invested or to keep people from trying to time the market it's interesting that you until say usc that, goes back to winning national championships every yeah. year there will still be problems and uncertainties and unsettled things in the world but that, that would save everything it just generally aligns with things functioning a little better yeah. i believe that i hear that of so, course when uh, usc was at its peak we had the iraq war we had the financial crisis so maybe okay. i'm wrong maybe about that but well anything to get people to I felt start better. timing the market less i, I would be yeah. completely in favor for because i agree it is a form of uh, financial suicide in many ways and yeah. despite the record being historically crystal clear I, investors uh, keep trying to trying to do it and i i think there's a lack of self-honesty there where they don't take into account their own track record of, and how terrible it is when they do try to time the market uh, you know, let's say they try to time the market around this corona thing and the market goes up, you know, I don't know, five, six percent in a couple months. They'll totally disregard the fact that they missed out on, you know, on significant gains because of because of their uh, timing experiments. So. so, Robert, let me ask you, what are the things not in the next week, three mm -hmm. weeks or for the extent of whatever coronavirus is going to be out there? Mm -hmm. Just bigger than that. What are the things you see as real assets? I, I think that that's a uh, part of being a value investor is you have absolutely no opinion on the timing of when the market captures the value that you believe is there. Yeah, something else on my mind a little bit is you talked a little bit about rates at the, at the beginning too. You know, the 10-year has been kind of a steady march downward during, mm -hmm. during last month. And, you know, certainly there's, there's discussions around how much of that is a, is a flight to safety, but certainly not all of that could, could be uh, what it's attributed to. I mean, we had slightly uh, better than consensus GDP uh, from from Q4 that came out, so sure I'm just did. wondering what's what's kind of uh, softening the outlook at, at the 10-year yield space right now. That would be a, that would be in the liability column of the, of right. the overall risk posture right yeah, now. Yeah, right. it's a very good point. I agree with you completely, Julian. What do you say? What are the assets? What are the liabilities? Well, I always uh, go back to uh, you know rates and, and earnings, and then so when I see the yield curve inverting again, um, that makes me more worried than than the coronavirus. Um, you know what is uh, what's the bond market trying to tell us basically, and so it's telling us they you know they want another one or two cuts this year, so not so confident about the, how good the economy is. Um, earnings are kind of mixed. Um, I, I'm wondering, you know. Uh, there was clearly a relief rally, and I guess we feel more better about uh, about the economy or like the invest manufacturing investing in particular because of the uh, phase one deal. The question. So I'm wondering how much now um, CEOs or boards, do, uh, how much are they going to be worried or propose 
um, any further investing because of the election. I mean, do that. We think it's not issue. You shouldn't stop investing because of the election. But everybody's, you know, uh, we hear a lot of clients, so we even debate about us how you know people are worried about having a progressist at the White House. So if you have boards and if you have CEOs also worried about that, thinking, oh, maybe I should wait until the end of the year to um, mm-hmm. for my next uh, plant or where I'm going to put it or the capex. I mean, is that could that impact the economy? Um, I'm, but you know what's interesting about that, Julian, is like let's say we were going to make the argument for the short-term uh, reactionism. Do, like, surely someone wanting to trade out because of Bernie Sanders knows that in two weeks there might be a new poll, and in four weeks Biden wins the state, and in eight weeks Bloomberg's a presence, and in 12 weeks Trump's rallying, and in 20 weeks. So even the short-term people know that this thing's going to bounce all around. I could see an argument. I would vehemently disagree with it, but at least it's intellectually reasonable to say, I think Bernie is going to take the lead and hold it all the way to November and win. So now, through that period, I intend to be sold out and and then go and wait. It's, it's kind of absurd, but at least that's different than, like, you're playing the short-term volatility and you're doing it with something that isn't short-term. Mm-hmm. It, it itself is going to bounce all around. It, it, I, I, I guess that the, um, the U.S. political thing is harder for me to reconcile than the interest rate deal from a true fundamental aspect. For one thing, and again, we're going to have a lot more to say on it after Iowa, after New Hampshire, but the reality is is that you would think the market, which do we all agree the market is smarter than political pundits on Fox and CNN? Yes. I, I, you would think I the market agree. would view Sanders winning as a positive because the market believes that Trump is more likely to beat Sanders than Biden. Am I right? So that you think yeah. the market would view Sanders so, if if the if the, if the if the news catalyst is okay. Sanders looking like more likely to get the nomination. Okay. Okay. That's a positive for yeah. the market in the sense that the market believes Trump is more likely to beat Sanders yeah. than Biden. Yeah. That Sanders can't beat. It is, Trump. but I guess yeah. the market. Yeah. The thing is, if if you have a you know a Biden, then the market would think it's win win. Or there's no loose scenario. Whoever wins, it'll be fine. I guess they they can see Sanders at the black swan. Yes. Yeah, but and I don't think don't the market have, believes that Biden wouldn't unwind some of Trump's financial deregulation, some of his energy. Dere- but I, I agree, Biden's no Sanders, but Biden's not going to be as market friendly as Trump. And I'm not being no. political here. I'm being Mr. Market. Yeah. But even I mean, if someone political. if someone has <laughs> conviction to believe in every dependent step that say gets Sanders into the White House, it doesn't make it the case that there's nothing to invest in. There's plenty to invest in that would be benefiting from a Sanders presidency yeah. out there. So I, I mean, I think I think the market certainly is smart enough to see that, and pundits can say what they will. By the way, what would you invest in in a Sanders presidency? <laughs> I don't want to live in that world. Yeah, <laughs> Coast, Costa Rican real <laughs> yeah, estate, or right, right. <laughs> it's windmills, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. No, I agree with you. There always is. Yeah, those things are easier to define in in a kind of traditional Democrat uh, scenario. But but I I think that. The volatility issue we're going to be with all year and because the coronavirus thing is there now. The yield curve, I suspect, points to a more substantive issue. All the rest of this is noise and volatility. As we've said over and over again, you understand we had the same conversation about Warren back in November, and now we're talking about she's going to get third or fourth place. Mm-hmm. I believe that the forces that move the tenure down to 150 – they were absent the conditions of August when the tenure last hit 150, with trade war pressures heightening. Uh, the, the tenure was well on its way down before coronavirus. I understand that gave it another leg down, but we can't blame the last. You can't blame the first 25 basis points on on that. Ultimately, there's no confidence, and there hasn't been forever, in long-term sustainable economic growth. And you're not going to get a tenure that stays above 2%. The Fed didn't pull it down. The Fed had pulled the short end of the curve down. The Fed can't control the long end of the curve. And that's why we've now reflattened after having uninverted is that the long end came down. They've brought the short end down. Mm -hmm. I think that you're still dealing with, and this is not three weeks, three months. This is out there. It's been out there. It's going nowhere. Long-term sustainable economic growth. There's no belief in it, and that's forcing long-term yields down. Am I right or wrong? I think you're totally right, and I think uh, our central bank is to blame. Yeah. Uh, and, th- and, the, and they keep uh, delaying the end of the repo purchases, the Q- QE4. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that, uh, that chart you shared with mm-hmm. the balance sheet is incredible. 
Yeah. I mean, I cannot believe just just the level of accommodation that is never it, that is seemingly perpetual. So, yeah, I, I think there needs to be more creative destruction for that type of long-term growth, and I don't think that the Fed is going to let it happen for a really long time. So, uh, so I completely agree with that long end, you know, suppression, long end of the curve, staying staying down. Now, now switching gears or kind of looking for a little add to this, Robert. When I say I think that we're in this suppressed long end, uh, end of the yield curve, interest rates have a hard time reflecting meaningful economic long-term optimism. Mm-hmm. Is that a, a reason to go risk off, or is that a reason to be selective in what you're S- investing in? Well, I mean, certainly the latter. You have to be selective, particularly in the fixed income space. You have to you have to be picking your assets uh, really wisely. I'd say, you know, our our philosophy, I think, a lot of times has been just because the market doesn't love something now doesn't mean they won't love it or we don't love it, right, in the, in the near future. Um, the, I, I, I couldn't agree more with you about that long-term growth. I mean, whether it's, you know, demographic issues or, you know, this, this slowing deployment of CapEx, whether that's going to happen now or three months down the road, it's a long-term trend. And I think the, one of the big hopes for, you know, the, the tax reform hasn't come to fruition, right? And that's, that's the fundamental thing. So there's what other knobs can can the, the the politicians turn certainly the fed is kind of stuck as as daya pointed out so it, it's a it's a tough picture and i think you know the the innovation and to your point the creative destruction mm-hmm. has to come into play uh, yeah and, and we're not seeing it so uh i don't i don't know what the solution is i don't all, all i know is that quality is going to matter at some point and i think that focusing on quality names uh is something that we'll, we'll continue to do well, and I, and I think that, that um, one could argue, and I wouldn't be real defensive about it, but I would disagree, but one could argue, if, if, if you reject the idea that one should be investing right now for PE expansion from already high PE companies, and then you have a month where reasonably priced things go lower, and, and reasonably high priced things have more PE expansion, I hope people understand, I'm being very honest here. That doesn't mean I was wrong. It means I'm more right now than I was a month ago. That there is even less of a conviction in praying for multiple expansion as your underlying investment thesis, and there's even more value. It was not like a month ago I was predicting it would happen in 30 days or 90 days or whatnot. Fundamentally, um, I think this is the, the Ben Graham has a cute line about it, and but it's really getting to what. Uh, Robert Graham, Ben Graham's great grandson, was actually <laughs> getting at is that in the short term we know that markets are voting machines, and in the long term they are weighing machines. Mm-hmm. And and I heard Jim Cramer on TV last week talking about a certain sector of the market that just has, has no chance of getting reflated because there's so many buyers that aren't coming in back into that space. He was talking about some big names in the energy sector. Mm-hmm. Well, he's totally wrong. You know that's completely untrue that uh, over time, anything can ever dictate the movement of a price other than the value. You're telling me if, and this is an if, if free cash flows are still growing, there's no, that just people boycotting a certain sector can never re-rate the stock. That is what? such an incredible denial of, of self-interest mm-hmm. uh, that you think there's no hedge funders out there that are going to capture that value arbitrage and play it to the what? hilt. They may be wanting to really push it down before they pull it up or I, I, whatever. My point being... In the long run, we know they're weighing machines, and I understand too. People say you're right, David, but we don't want the long run to mean five years or seven years. I'm just simply saying that there are things in the market that worked in January that worked off a of multiple expansion, and there are things that got cheaper that are really fundamentally solid. There also are fundamentally solid names that went higher in January. They they kind mm-hmm. of finally got rewarded a bit, and you saw some 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 price movement there. But but the the idea of a very um, high dispersion market environment right now, I think that's reinforced by what we saw in the first month of the year. What do you think, Julian, as we go to the second half of earnings season? Well, I feel like this is all, uh, again, like back, this is all correlated to the cheap money and what it creates. So it allows, you know, companies that don't make any cash flow to, uh, you know, uh, have crazy valuations and be able to raise debt or mm-hmm. raise equity and, and destroy uh, industries or sectors, you know, reshape the whole economy. So it's kind of, that's what's uh, extraordinary about having uh, rates uh, here. But uh, I guess it's, you know, at the end of the day, as an investor, you feel comfortable owning you know, companies that are generating cash flow, that have been around for, for a long time and that are growing. And um, you know, they, are not, they haven't done great uh, the first uh, months, but you know, it's, uh, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. 
So we'll see who's around in 10 years. I think we should do a podcast sometime uh, dedicated to that subject about what what it is like how to say this mm. if the fed gets everyone dependent on certain behavior and believes certain conditions exist and i don't think the fed should have done it but they did it d- is the fed then wrong to undo what they first did see this is the issue that's so interesting to me ethically is we talk about creative destruction okay the fed has told you you need to have a green light to go into certain spectrums of the credit market. They're, they're not free cash flow generating, but we're giving you the reason to in, to either lend money or to buy equity in these companies. But then if they go, hey, you know what, this is really irresponsible. We got to pull the punch bowl back here. And they go wipe out a bunch of people and you get the self-fulfilling prophecy down. Is that any way to administer monetary policy? Uh, to make yourself not credible as a central banker by setting up one thing and then pulling it down. The sooner, as soon as I say that, there's critics that would go, no, 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 the Fed not, never should have that moral hazard where they keep a bad habit going cause, just because they did it. But see, I'm not sure I agree. I think that, they're, that they shouldn't do what they do, and then when they do it, you, you at least have to wean the market off of an addiction you help create. You know, Otherwise, you, you kill the addict. So you're saying that a huge reversal, even though it's uh, obviously if you're type of free market bent, uh, is not something that you think they should do. I think what I'm saying is we should do a podcast to discuss okay. it. Because mm-hmm. I have strong opinions on it. If yeah. I get into it now, we're going to be okay, here another yeah. half hour. Yeah, but uh, yeah, right. But I think yeah, more of a transitionary thing would probably be more appropriate. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that podcast too. I, I have a lot to say about it as well. Uh, Ten seconds, take us out, Dea, then Robert, then Julian. Okay, uh, yeah, so just keep focusing on long term. A uh, little bit of volatility. It, it looks like the market uh, is looking for reasons to sell off and, and then snap back. So a little bit of volatility is okay and, and, and get used to it. Stay focused on your, uh, your, your individual or family time horizon. Know, know the, uh, the volatility that comes with equities and be prepared for it and be prepared to be uh, rewarded for it. For me, it's all uh, down to uh, earnings, and we've seen a lot last week. I have uh, quite a lot more this week, and so that's what I'm going to be uh, f- uh, focused on. And then, you know, keeping an eye on rates and the and the curve. Really, that's the two things that I think matters. You know, the risk-free rate, so what the Fed, uh, you know, said as the risk-free, and then the risk premium for uh, different asset classes with different type of risk and volatility. Absolutely, all good comments. Take us out. Thank you all for listening here to this week's special dividend cafe. Uh, market volatility is the norm. It is the rule, not the exception, and we're having it right now. Uh, there's some question marks out there. We're looking at some short-term things like coronavirus. We're looking at mid-term things like the U.S. election, and we're looking at long-term things like the yield curve and the overall state of secular growth in the U.S. economy. Uh, short, mid, long, plenty to talk about. We hope you've gotten something out of this week's podcast. Reach out to anyone, anytime at the Bonson Group with questions you have. Uh, particular clients of ours, contact your private wealth advisor if you have any questions. In the meantime, as Julian has said, it's earnings, and then we want to look to uh, where the Fed you know, comes in to price these things. But the risk on argument is there. You have a very positive credit environment. You have very low inflation. The risk off argument right now is not satisfying to us, a virus that could very well be out of the news in a few weeks. We're thinking bigger than that because that's our job as your fiduciary advisor. Thank you for listening to the Dividend Cafe.